I'm going to stop that presentation because uh, I've mentioned the World Congress a few times and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that now. Um, and what I wanted to talk about uh, was to give you an example of the type of presentations that IACL gives to its members. And this was a presentation that I wrote last year with Fabrizio Zeri, and um, many of you will know Fabrizio. Um, he, he worked at the University of Trey in, in Roma. Um, he's taking two years uh, sabbatical and working at Aston University, and he has one more year working with us. And together we gave a, a lecture about how to teach contact lenses and, um, and how to incorporate what we call blended learning. And this lecture was aimed at educators, aimed at teachers, but I think it's very relevant to practitioners because the way that you access material is also different now than it was 10 or 20 years ago. 10 or 20 years ago, you, if you wanted to learn about um, a, a particular topic, you went to a lecture or you read a book. Now it's very different. For, uh, uh, for example, I, I enjoy skiing, and um, James was talking about um, different pairs of shoes, and uh, you, know, you don't have one pair of shoes. Uh, I also don't have one pair of skis. I have five pairs of skis. <laughs> and my wife thinks I'm a little bit crazy because I get excited by skis, and sometimes I always say to her that, can we just go and I can just touch some skis in the shop, you know, and so we just go to the shop and I look at the skis. <laughs> And um, I have short skis, fat skis, long skis, racing skis, uh, off-mountain skis, every type. So, but I wanted to learn how to maintain my skis. I wanted to learn how to wax them properly and keep the edges clean and sharp. So how did I do that? I went to YouTube. I looked at a, at a lecture on YouTube on how to wax and repair skis. And then I went to Amazon and eBay and bought the products I needed. I didn't go to a shop, I stayed inside my house, and now I have an area in my garage where I keep the skis and I wax them and I clean them and sharpen them and I have all the instruments there. So no one taught me how to do that. I learnt from watching lectures, watching YouTube lectures. Now, I'm not saying optometry is the same, but many students will tell me that I didn't understand the slit lamp lecture last week, but I found a good video on YouTube. Can I use that? Of course, if that helps you to learn, then sure, you can supplement your learning with these additional materials. <clears throat> so I want to talk a little bit about what we call blended learning. And um, in, in blended learning, we say that the, 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 the magic is in the mix. It's how we combine the different elements. And, and the rationales of blended learning are in the roots of psychology as well. So this is something to, to bear in mind. And the third point in this lecture will be how we use blended learning in optometry and particularly in contact lenses. So let's look at the definition of blended learning. According to Wikipedia, blended learning is a formal educational program where the student learns at least part of the delivery of the content through digital and online media. The final part of this definition is probably the most important. The student controls the time, the place, the path, and the pace of the delivery. So the student can stop and start the lecture, they can slow it down, they can listen to it again, if they didn't understand something, they can rewind. So they can listen to one point again and again until they feel comfortable with that, that point. But you could argue that really most types of teaching is really blended learning, because even Primary school learning, where they have lectures, they have classrooms, they have practicals, we have clinics, we have what we call self-directed learning. Somebody will say, go and read this chapter in the textbook. Um, you revise, you have background material, uh, you listen to maybe a recorded lecture as well, and you might view something somewhere else. So all our teaching is really a type of blended learning, but I'm going to talk specifically about this online digital media. And I think a, probably a better definition of blended learning is blended learning is the effective combination of different modes of delivery, modes, models of teaching, and styles of learning. And the student has different styles of learning, but the teacher can use different modes of, of delivery to enhance their experience. 
So I hope these videos work. Let's try. What is blended learning? If you think about the traditional classroom environment on one end of the spectrum, and on the other end of the spectrum is a student learning on a computer at home, blended learning is somewhere in the middle. Now, let's ask ourselves, how do we differentiate and individualize instruction in the classroom? Frankly, students are not engaged in lecture-style instruction. We know that small group instruction, personal learning plans, guided practice, and inquiry-based teaching all lead toward a better and deeper understanding of concepts. Unfortunately, differentiation and feedback doesn't scale without technology. So blended learning is about leveraging digital content to provide students with skills and practice. Meanwhile, the teacher focuses on depth and application of concepts to teach higher order thinking skills. So what if we can create an environment where, one, students can get individualized self-paced instruction, two, teachers can provide differentiated small group instruction based upon weekly or daily data, and three, schools can operate at a much lower cost per pupil, which will allow them to reallocate resources. This environment is blended learning. So really blended learning acknowledges that when a teacher stands in a classroom, that's the most expensive part of the teaching process. The teacher physically being there is the most expensive part, but it's also the most valuable part. So let's use that part in the most effective way. So instead of the teacher just giving a lecture, lots of information, throwing that information at the students, the students have the information already, and then the teacher can say, okay, you already have the lecture, you listen to the slides, let's talk about those things. Let's see where that can be applied. In fact, you listen to the lecture on keratoconus. Let me tell you about a patient that I fitted who was keratoconic, and this is what I tried. That didn't work. Why do you think it didn't work? Well, then I tried this. Do you think that was a good idea? So we can make it more interactive, and the, the students can engage more with the material. Now, the, the little video clip I, I just played the voice in that video clip was somebody called Salman Khan. Does anybody know who Salman Khan is? Anybody heard this name? Well, some of you might know if you watch Indian movies, if you watch Bollywood movies, Salman Khan is a very, very famous Bollywood actor. He's probably the most famous Bollywood actor at the moment. So you can type him into a Google search engine. And um, he's always um, very popular in, in India because he's also unmarried, so the girls get very excited that he's still a bachelor. So. <laughs> and also, if you look at his, his, his features, and uh, those of you who know Fabrizio will kind of imagine, if Fabrizio was standing here next to me and you put us both together and mixed us into blended learning into one person, Fabrizio and I would look like this. <laughs> <laughs> But this actually isn't the real Salman Khan who gave the lecture. He is Salman Khan, but this is the Salman Khan who gave the lecture. He looks more like a teacher. <laughs> and this Salman Khan was, he's, he's a very clever at maths. And his younger cousin lived in another part of the USA. He lives, he's from the USA. And she asked him to help her with the maths homework. So they went on to Skype, and he was helping her, showing her on his computer how to do maths homework on Skype, and she thought, this is great, I'm learning maths better than I learn at school. So she told her friends, and her friends said, we want to learn with, with, your, with your cousin. So they all came to her house, and they watched on Skype, and there was a video link up, and then he thought, this is a great idea. So he wrote a business plan, and he was given funding of a million dollars by Google, a million dollars by the Bill Gates and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, Carlos Sim in Mexico also gave him a, a huge donation. AT&T, the telecommunications company, gave him a huge donation. So he had massive donations, millions of dollars of donations, to set this program up. Now, his program is set up for secondary school, for high school, not for university. But I'll show you an example of that in a second. And what they try and do is they have face-to-face -face, um, didactic material, blended learning, and online. So there's a mixture of those elements. And the, the Khan Academy is what he set up. And um, for example, in, in Time magazine, they uh, 
cited Salman Khan as one of the 100 most influential people in the world at the moment. And he's a teacher. You know, he's one of the most influential people. And I'm going to show you, this is a very basic uh, link. And this is just for, for junior primary school children about counting. So you'll see an example here of... of um, I think the sound is not on. Okay, okay, the sound isn't on, but it's, you know it's, it's not that important. But basically, here he has a um, here he has the, the the classroom lecture, but online. So he's recorded this with his sound, and he's teaching the the children. These are for young children how to count and how to subtract. Uh, oh, oh, it hasn't come up. Sorry. Um, okay, I have to do something with this. Let's see what I have to do. Do I have to do something with this? Okay, I think it's this one. Yeah, okay. Let's try that again. Uh, sorry, I'll have to play it again. Sorry about that. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, okay, it's, oh, here we go, rewatch with you. There we go. Sorry, there's, there's, uh, for some reason there's no sound, but um, essentially here he has a counting exercise, count the squirrels, put the squirrels in the box, and the, the, you can see the question is, put seven squirrels in the box. Then the next slide will be, remove three squirrels from the box, uh, add five more squirrels, uh, then he will have pictures of horses and squirrels and say add three horses and two squirrels like this. So the child can work through. There is some sound but it's not really working properly here so I, I can ignore that, that's okay. Okay, so let me move on. Now, as I mentioned, Google invested quite heavily in the Khan Academy, and there is this increasing interest. And if you look in Google and type in the key term blended learning, there are nearly five and a half million results for blended learning. If you go to PubMed or something like this, you will see also this increase in scientific publications around blended learning. It's becoming more and more popular over the last decade. And this is one paper um, from um, uh, a journal called Higher Education, and they anal analyzed the trends in blended learning. And also they showed the same thing, that there was an increase in the number of scientific publications in that field of blended learning. We need to encode this information into the uh, student's memory. So what we do know about this, the cognitive psychology of students is that They'll have a multimedia presentation, sensory memory comes in to play, working memory takes some of the information, but once it's in the long-term memory, then it's, uh, it's, it's learnt, essentially. The temporary, uh, the working memory is a temporary storage system that only holds information for a short period. The long-term memory combines with prior knowledge, and then we have a more permanent store, a more permanent hard drive, if you like, for information for longer periods. And to get these memory systems working, we have images, we have words, and sometimes we focus on keywords and key images, and they help us to revise material. 
We organize these images and words in our brain, and then we can integrate them into our memories. So these are the sort of what we call the cognitive science behind the principles of learning. We have separate channels for visual and verbal information. Um, we also know that individuals can only process small amounts of information along each channel at any one time. And then they can organize these, and once they're organized in their long-term memory, they're easier for the, the uh, subject to integrate. And we have these sort of limited capacity processes in, in, in our brain. So we, we can't just take all the information and record it all uh, at random. And, oh, sorry. What I'm going to do now is an exercise where I'm going to flash up some numbers. Uh, we, we did this in a small group and we made people write them down. I don't need to do that now. But if you have a pen and a piece of paper, that would be helpful. Um, because what I want you to do is you will see two lines of ten numbers. And I want you to write down the numbers and try and write them down in the sequence that they appear. So they should be in the right order. Sorry, there are two lines of 11 numbers, not 10 numbers. OK, so let's go. So the first number will appear. And you'll see numbers appearing randomly in two lines. I want you to try and organize them in the correct sequence, if you can. OK, I think we're done. Did anybody get the numbers? Did anybody have a result? OK, you have? Far away, read the numbers out. <laughs> well, you can, if you want to, you can show me. I can read it out. Okay, that's actually very good. That's very close, but it's not right. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll tell you the numbers. I'll tell you the answers. The first line was 07974. 383481. The second line was 0121204132. Yeah? Anybody close? A few people? Laura may be close. <laughs> close? Good. Okay. Uh, I didn't memorize those numbers just now. I didn't memorize the numbers when I wrote these slides. Uh, I know those numbers because they're my phone numbers. <laughs> So those numbers are in my long-term memory. <laughs> but the point here is that we, we say that the, the humans have this sort of magic number seven. So we can remember seven items, and sometimes plus or minus two. So sometimes we can maybe extend that up to nine. But really to have 22 numbers presented to you in one go is unlikely that you will remember. Now, the way the numbers appeared as well, they appeared in the right sequence. So maybe you, you had some chance of getting some of them. But really, I, I don't think anybody will have got all those numbers correct. Another part of learning is our motivation. Usually the student's motivation is to pass the exam, or to pass the fellowship, or to, if they pass this exam, they will get a better job, and they will have a job with an increased salary. So there's some motivation to the learning element. And there's also attention. At the moment, everyone's pretty much attent. After lunch, when we have our heavy lunch, everyone will be a little bit more like this, so the attention span will go. And learning will be affected by this. Blended learning gets around this problem when you're like this, you don't have to listen to the lecture, or you can rewind it and listen to it slowly. Now, here's a, here's a really good exercise. So I want you to count how many times the players wearing the white T-shirts pass the ball. Okay? So it's quite a simple exercise. So count how many times the players will pass the ball. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball.
answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? Did, you, did anybody get 16? Okay. okay. Did you see the gorilla? Okay, let's, let's show you. Did you see anything else? Anything else unusual in the video? Okay, okay, good, good. For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. Did, did anybody say, when I watched that... So when I watched that for the very first time, I saw the gorilla, I saw the person leave the, um, the, the stage, I counted 15, I didn't count 16, um, but I didn't see the curtain change. So um, there are so many things happening in the video. Now, um, in fact, that's a, it's a really useful sort of exercise. And it's been used by other companies. This is one, um, this is an advertisement that was on the UK television, and um, maybe it was here as well, I'm not sure. Uh, but I'll show you this advertisement on, on YouTube. Hopefully it will work. To test just how much attention the attention-stealing design of the new Skoda Fabia actually steals, we left one parked on this ordinary road in West London. We wanted to see if its sharp crystalline shapes, bold lines and lower, wider profile would attract the desired level of attention. Will the 17-inch black alloy wheels stop passers-by in their tracks? Will the angular headlights attract the attention of other road users? Will a crowd gather to check out its fresh, sporty look? Well, not quite. But did the attention-stealing design distract you from noticing that the entire street has been changing right before your very eyes? Don't believe us? Have another look. Did you spot the van changing to a taxi? How about the scooter changing to a pair of bicycles? Or the lady holding a pig? Let alone the fact that the entire street is now completely different. Didn't think so. So there we have it. Proof that the new Skoda Fabia is truly attention stealing. So it's, it's quite a clever use of the, that gorilla uh, illusion in an advertisement to, um, to divert your attention away from what's happening and say that it's because the car's so fascinating, you, you just watch the car. <clears throat> if you were in control of the video, you could pause it, you could see, you could see all the little effects that are happening in the video. But let me change this a little bit now. Let me talk a little bit more about blended learning in our field, ophthalmic field, and especially the contact lens experience. Now, I don't know if you can see, you've probably just about read that slide. For those teachers, if you're teaching your students refraction, these are typically the topics that you will include. You will include something about retinoscopy, maybe something about ophthalmoscopy, uh, subjective refraction, communication skills, history and symptoms, binocular balancing, um, near vision assessment, eye movement assessments, et cetera, et cetera. So these are typically the topics that you will teach somebody. But if you give lectures on these topics, will your student be able to refract? No, of course not. So you supplement those lectures in blended learning with practical training. So you say, today in the morning, we're going to have this lecture on uh, binocular balancing, and in the afternoon, we will have a practical class, and we will show you how to do that, so you can practice with your partner. So this is how we learned optometry. This is how we learned our skills. Everything, slit lamp, ophthalmoscopy, contact lens fitting, everything we learned in this lecture format with a practical element. And that's exactly the same in contact lenses. Now, in our university, James teaches uh, contact lenses at the first stage uh, in our second year of our program. And this is his list of lectures. So he has lectures on um, slit lamp, 
tear film, soft lens fitting, uh, evaluation of lenses, toric lenses, silicon hydrogel, you can see the whole list of lectures. Again, at the end of those lectures, the student does not know how to fit contact lenses, but he supplements that with practicals. So he has a practical on tear film assessment. You will listen to a lecture with him, and then you will go to a practical class, and he will show you how to do that, and then he will make you practice yourself, and he will watch you to do that practice. But in fact, we take this one stage further at our university, and we have virtual lectures. So we actually don't stand in front of our students and give them a lecture. So we have virtual lectures on those topics. What do we mean by virtual lecture? Well, this is a pre-recorded PowerPoint slide where the student listens to the slide. They can rewind, forward, stop, pause, magnify it. They can look at it at their, under their own control. And then they will come to a session in the lecture theater with Professor Wolfson, and he will say, you listen to the lecture on uh, tear film analysis. Well, who knows the most effective way of looking at the tears? I do, I know, tear breakup time. Great, that's a good answer. What's the problem with tear breakup time? Uh, I'm not sure. Anybody else? Oh yeah. Maybe because we put fluorescein in, we disrupt the tear film. Good, okay. Can you show me how you do it? Come over here. We have a slit lamp here, set up with a camera. Show everybody how you put fluorescein in. So we can do a live demonstration, we can interact, we can ask questions, we can even say, I saw a patient last week where this happened and the dry eye was very dry, I had to do this. So the student has all the information in the recorded lecture. Then they have supplementary information from us. And then they have the practical session as well. So they get extra uh, types of learning. What if the student doesn't arrive to the lecture? doesn't arrive to the seminar, they don't arrive to the session. Well, then they still have the core material. The exam will be based on the material that's in the narrated lecture. The live session with the teacher is to enhance your learning. And we do have this problem. Sometimes our students don't attend the live session. But those students do worse in the exams. The ones who, who listen to the lecture, attend the live session, attend the practicals, they are the best students. Some students think, well, the lecture is on the, on the internet. I don't need to go. Then don't go. You will get a, a worse mark. The students who come to my lecture will be the better students, the ones who want to talk to me, who want to answer my questions. So as teachers, we get the better students, and they get the better marks. So if you, if you want to be a better student, come. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's simple. You know, it's, it's not a complicated sort of a, uh, equation here. <clears throat> Oh, this is an example of a lecture I do on content and solutions, just to sh so you can hear what a PowerPoint with narration is like. So this is a PowerPoint slide. Improper use of care products can lead to problems. Residual surfactant cleaner that's not rinsed off a contact lens can sting if it's left on the lens and inserted onto the eye. This would lead to an immediate discomfort, but gradually as the reflex lacrimation kicks in, the tears would rinse away the residual surfactant, and that... Okay, so you, hear, you heard there that I wasn't just reading the slide, because if you just read the slide, the student can read it themselves. So in fact, what I was doing was reading the slide and giving extra information. So straight away, the student has the core information, they have a little bit extra for my, my voice, and then they will come to the seminar and they will hear me talk about that in a different way. They will hear me ask questions or give them examples. And this is the full contact lens program we have in our second year that uh, James looks after. So we have a list of virtual lectures. We have a list of seminars, the live interaction with the, the teacher, and then a list of practicals. So the student knows that I have to listen to this before I go to that session and before I go to that practical. So they have all the information ready for them. Now, we use blended learning a lot in our university. We have a, a master's program uh, for our UK students, and these are students who finish the normal three-year bachelor's, and they undertake um, their master's level at the same time as their internship, their, their registration year. And they have virtual lectures, exactly like I showed you, and supported by their own clinical experience, and they have to produce case reports and coursework. 
and have exams. We also have a virtual uh, learning environment platform for our doctorate program. So we have a doctorate of optometry program where it's the same level as a PhD but involves less research and the, it has a lot of taught element. And the taught element is taught with blended learning, virtual learning lectures. The students listen to the lectures, they answer the questions online, and at the end of completing nine modules online, they have to do a research project. The research project, of course, they have to do in their own clinics or they can come to the university, but that's a separate thing away from the blended learning. And then they will get a doctorate level uh, thesis at the end of this. We have, um, uh, I was listening to some, uh, we have a new system in the UK called uh, Enhanced Optical Services. These are people who want to do more clinical services in their practice. And I, I, I've registered to, to do this myself. And to do that, I have to listen to seven lectures online and do the multiple choice questions at the end. And I did the first one. And I listened to little bits of it and thought, I'll, you know, I'm a teacher, I know everything about this, so I just listened to little parts. And I got 75% in the assessment. The second one, uh, it's a little bit embarrassing to admit to, but it was on dry eye. And I thought, in fact, I'm a contact lens teacher, I know everything about dry eye. So I won't listen to the lecture, I'll just answer the questions. And I got 50%. <laughs> I got half of the questions wrong. And in fact, it said, you didn't pass with enough grade, you, you have to listen to the lecture again. So it wouldn't let me proceed into the next stage of the course. So now I have to go back and listen to the whole lecture. And um, so you know, the students can't cheat blended learning. They, and also as teachers, we can, we can monitor that. We can see on the virtual learning platform, did the student actually listen to the lecture? Did, how long did they spend? It's a one hour lecture, did they spend 10 minutes? Did they spend one hour or two hours with that lecture? So we can monitor that. And that helps us to help the students as well. <clears throat> now, James has already mentioned these, and I've mentioned the uh, IACL one. Um, but there are these international sort of higher degrees and qualifications and fellowships, MSEs, PhDs, um, FIACL we've mentioned already, uh, American Academy, BCLA, European Academy. The FIACL one has an element of blended learning. If you want to take the FIACL exam, there is a distance learning program that you can listen to material online that prepares you for that accreditation exam. The other fellowships don't really have that in the same way because they don't have an exam, but they all have examples of successful fellowships. So if you want to undertake a fellowship with the BCLA, you can go onto their webpage and look at successful examples of how people gained that fellowship. So how do they present their information? So th there is an element of the blended learning there as well. And w one thing I should also point out, and this is a question I always get asked, students who undertake higher degrees or fellowships, this doesn't mean that you can work in another country. It's not a clinical examination. It's an examination or a fellowship to show that you've achieved a higher level in your profession, esteem, as James called it, or kudos, as he called it earlier. It shows that you have the same level of training or understanding in a topic as colleagues from another country or another institution. It doesn't necessarily mean that you can work in their country or they can work in your country. So it's a different to a clinical qualification. Now, in Italy, of course, we know that optometry isn't recognized truly as a profession here. We know that many places teach optometry and we know that the scope of practice is limited. But also the scope of teaching is limited. It's difficult to teach dilation and contact procedures in Italy because the legislation doesn't necessarily allow that unless there is a, a medical doctor or in a certain so other situations present. Opticians, of course, do have recognition. And uh, what we want to do is, is change the level of optics in Italy to optometry in a more uh, global way so that optometry practice here is more like it is on an international standing. And how can we do that? Education. We have to use education. In fact, because of the limitations of teaching here, we have to use some type of virtual learning and blended environments as well. The program that uh, uh, we have with um, Institute Zaccanini, with, with Georgia's institution, is that the students have a two-year optician's diploma from any Italian institution. Any Italian institution can, can apply. And then they get direct entry into our second year of our program they are exempt from the first year. 
and they go straight into the second year and they have virtual learning uh, lectures and they have a local tutor who supports that learning. But the material is written by the Aston University lecturers, it's narrated, the sound is by the Aston University lectures, lecturers, and then the local teachers here will say, you just listened to Shazad Nehru's lecture on um, keratoconus and contact lens fitting. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my experience so they can include their own experience. And maybe they'll have their own slides which they can say, well, he said this in his lecture, I disagree a little bit, I want to show you why. Here's some more slides about keratoconus. So they can do that. Or they can say, well, I agree with that, but here's a really good picture or a good video to show you more about that. And then we have practical training. So this, the parts of the course which can't be taught in Italy, we bring the students to Aston University in the summer and we teach them those elements when they come to us. So they come to us for one month and in that month we give them a one month clinical training, no lectures, just clinical training with, with patients. So does it work? Does blended learning work? We think so. <laughs> the evidence suggests that it does work. Uh, the US Department of Education suggests uh, that people who go through these blended learning type have stronger learning outcomes than those who only have face-to-face -face instruction. So we think the evidence is there and we think there's scientific proof of that as well. There are lots and lots of resources that can help you. Um, time is short, so I'm not going to show you the, the IACL case reports, but we have a, a, a method of using case reports where the student can sit there with a, with a case report and work through that um, and they can work through that at their own pace. So I'm going to stop at that point. I know the se next session is due, so thank you very much.